That's the sound of a real aluminum bat. And that's the sound of a prop bat made for Hollywood fight scenes. Mm -hmm. Not much feeling to it. Until you hear them, or squeeze them, you probably can't tell the difference. And that's the whole point. On camera, they have to look identical. That's thanks to the skills of the prop makers, who mold rubber stunt props and add realistic textures and dramatic flair. Each move in a fight can call for a different, specially rigged prop. Oh my God. Depending on the scene, there can be as many as four different versions of a prop in the mix. We had a scene on Euphoria, and it called for one of our actors to approach another actor and basically hit him in the head. When you read something like that, my brain automatically goes to, I need different versions of it. That's Josh, a prop master who's worked on Euphoria, Everything Everywhere All at Once, Blonde, and Don't Worry Darling. And this is his prop truck in Los Angeles, where he keeps stuff like this dulled down pie cutter from Everything Everywhere, or this set of hammers used in Euphoria. Productions often use the real deal for close-ups or pickup shots, or for practical use. Like if we were gonna be using one of the hammers with a real nail, we'd wanna use a real hammer. Then when the actor goes in to interact with the other characters in the film, and then that's when a stunt hammer would come into play. <laughs> this, this, this has no weight to it. This is like, wow, this is like really light. Stunt props look indistinguishable from the real thing. This has just the same level of distress. See all those little nicks and bumps? Prop making houses like ISS in LA create molds to capture all those details. How intricate can a thing you mold be? We can pick up pretty much any detail. They add some structure by burying a super thin metal armature beneath the foam. So when actor is, I'm gonna get you, this isn't flopping around. So we have like basically three different densities. There are super soft foams, like the one we just saw for when an actor's actually getting hit with the prop. A medium, which is used for like stunts, that like nobody's getting hit with it, but there's a possibility that somebody's gonna get hit with it. Sure. And then there's what this hammer was cast in. Mm. Oh man. <laughs> the firmer rubber that Jack's pouring into the mold here. Just our standard firm rubber. So this was one of our test hammers that we did on Euphoria. Basically we would put a bladder in here full of liquid and then it would, whatever angle off camera, you wouldn't see it. And then as soon as it hit, you'd, you'd squeeze, squeeze it, it and then blood would come out. Smart. I feel like, I mean, I'm just gonna like, all right, so this, I'd probably be annoyed if I was the actor getting hit in this on like take seven or eight, I'd be like, I think we got it. If we were to use the blood that would come out of it, it's not an over and over kind of thing. This would be a complete reset of the actor. They'd have to get all their the blood removed, all the hair redone. It'd probably get on their costume, on their skin. You'd have a lot of reset time. So it wouldn't be hit after hit with that one. You know, you could do hit after hit running into it. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, that one has some feeling to it. Yeah, even... And now do the real one. Yeah. <laughs> they have ready-made molds like this one for hundreds of fight props, with everything from cast iron pans and meat cleavers to fake armor and weights. Ugh, now go get the fake ones, right? Ugh. And they can make a realistic fake of basically any object. Where people have brought in like fruit, they brought in like uh, apples, oranges. Making props for a fight scene isn't just about creating different versions of a given prop. Josh also often has to rig props to give them a specific cinematic flourish for each scene. For this shot and everything everywhere, he filled a dummy laptop with microchips and silver mylar confetti. So it looked like the glass screen was breaking spectacularly on camera. He found that confetti looked better on camera than breakaway glass. I had basically sawed down the middle and hot glued it all together. So it was just as soon as it went into the air and it made contact with the pipe, it just blew apart. And for this shot, just a few moments later, when Michelle Yeoh holds up a computer keyboard as a shield, the special effects team took a real keyboard and rigged it so that Andy Lee could easily plunge the pipe through. And it looked like all the keys were coming out on the other side. They actually just bored a hole straight through the center, the size of the pipe. The reverse side where it was flat, it was just a piece of cardstock that was painted to be the same color of the, the keyboard. And then on the front side, all the keys that we had removed when we cut it, we just hot glued them back into place. They also had crew members off camera tossing loose computer keys into the air. To add more drama to it, just to give it that extra hit of, you know, debris. Regardless of the type of prop, keeping everyone as safe as possible includes swapping out tiny details, 
like removing the small pieces of exposed metal on the riot shield that Michelle had to spin around in fights, or the zippers and buckles on Kihi Kwan's fanny pack. There's a scene in the film where he actually uses it like a nunchuck. I would replace all the plastic, anything that would come in contact with an actor. The buckles and zippers became pieces Josh cut out of foam. Gosh, see, child's refrigerator art. <laughs> and this keychain became a little yellow ball of tape. If you have the same general shape, the same general color, you know, when it's flying through the air really fast, it's hard to tell with the naked eye unless you pause it right at that moment. Well, I almost wanted to create a foam version of this but because of the, the shot style and the close-up of it, it wasn't as practical as having the real thing would be. The fanny pack itself is already a soft leather, and then I would fill it with like bubble wrap to make it look bulky and uh, able to swing. Safety is primary, even if no one's actually getting hit with the prop. There's a, you know, camera tricks that you can use where, you know, you hit somebody and it just grazes their face, and oh. with reactions, you can... Uh, I do that again. Ugh. Jeez, dude, I just asked. <laughs> it's like a, like a, almost like a camera trick. Like with this crowbar fight in Euphoria. It's very hard to tell in that scene. We actually didn't have the actor getting hit with it. So it's a kind of like a, a backhand swing and then the actor goes flying and they actually had put a mat painted to look just like the cement underneath. And then it had like tapered edges. It looks like it's around the concrete. Yeah, it was, it was very seamless. So why use this rubber crowbar? If the actor's swing is slightly off, or the person on the receiving end moves slightly and ends up making contact with the prop, it adds another layer of safeguarding. And it's not just weapons that need forethought. Sometimes it's the environment. That's where these customizable blood rugs come in. Our blood, it's usually glycerin, water, and then red food coloring, and it can stain. So if we have an instance where there's no interaction with an actor with it, and say an actor is on the ground and they have trauma to the head, there's just a pool of blood, these are a perfect way to get around having a cleanup. Besides saving resetting time, these mats have other advantages over fake liquid blood. Because it is a glycerin, it's a very slippery material. It eliminates the, the risk of stepping in it and slipping or tracking it around. Around. So if somebody stepped on this, they would probably leave a, a dusty footprint, but you could clean it off with Windex. Uh, versus stepping in a pool of blood, you'd leave a trail of uh, footprints around the set. Victims of a fight may need to be faked as well. Stunt dummies, or action mannequins, one of ISS's most commonly rented props. There are two varieties. Basic stunt dummies, which are stuffed with cloth limbs, and more realistic, articulated dummies made out of rubber or plastic. The first kind is floppier, while the second kind is poseable and will sink or fall in a more human-like way. And it's all adjustable, so you can open up the torso, and then there's some bungees in there that are connected to all the limbs that you can adjust the tightness of. Oh, nice. Black is left leg, white's right leg. If you want the legs to be dislocated, you can dislocate them. No, I don't, actually. It's really unsettling. <laughs> Dummies might be used instead of background extras for shots that would be uncomfortable. If there's an aftermath of a war scene, so they have 50 people laying face down in the mud, they don't have to pay background artists to go in there. They dress these dudes and ladies in wardrobe. If they want weird dislocated parts or weird positions of the limbs, they can go in there, uh, loosen up those little bolts, yeah. pull them tight to cinch it, and then all the joints stay in place. These can also stand for actors in scenes involving unsurvivable hits or stunts. Yeah, I mean, these things have fallen off buildings. They've been inside cars that have driven off cliffs. You can see some of them are pretty charred up. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot better for them to put a $1,100 dummy in a car that's going off a cliff and exploding than a, person. than a person. When filming a fight, every move needs to be thought of, every variable controlled for, to the point where you can have four different versions of a prop in rotation, with a different version used in every shot. So when he was approaching her with those, those would be the real ones. So then when we set up this shot, he would have the stunt versions. And the audience never knows the difference. I mean, when you got this back, were you like, what did you do to my dummy? <laughs> <laughs>